you've caught me totally. Okay, there we are. You have Mr. Kayumi's biography and the details. I think what is really critical, however, is that he is the chief advisor to President Ghani in dealing with infrastructure, human capital, and technology. Far too often when we talk about Afghanistan, we talk about it in terms of tactical events, military encounters, the number of advisors, or the numbers of troops. But the future of Afghanistan and the success of any kind of counterinsurgency campaign is a matter of dealing with human beings. It is a matter of winning popular support. It is a matter of mixing security with development and providing the basic needs that people have, the needs that lead them to support the government, that provide the kind of sustained capability to actually turn a counterinsurgency campaign into some kind of meaningful victory. And that, I think, is what Mr. Kayumi is going to be addressing. What we're going to do is have him provide an overview of some of the key developments taking place in Afghanistan. He and I will then have a brief dialogue and we'll open things up to questions. Now let me repeat that word, question. It usually ends with a question mark. It is not a speech and it has to be simple enough so somebody can understand the question and answer it. Uh, if you look around, you also see that we need to give people the opportunity, or as many people as possible, to actually ask that question. So, one question, and I will ask you when you have the opportunity to please identify yourself so people in the audience know who you are and some idea of your affiliation. With that, Mr. Kayumi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, such a pleasure to be back at CSIS and uh, to have a chance to have a uh, conversation about what's going on in Afghanistan. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, express on behalf of the Afghan people and its government, uh, uh, express the deep uh, gratitude for the uh, great support that the U.S. government and uh, U.S. taxpayers have done for Afghanistan. A special tribute is always in order to all of the families and all of those uh, fallen heroes of, uh, that uh, fought uh, side by side with Afghan soldiers and made the ultimate sacrifice for in the cause of uh, democracy, in the cause of freedom, in the cause of fighting uh, global uh, terrorism. The question will be is that uh, is the fight over? No, unfortunately, if you look at in the past, uh, uh, you know, 15 years after 9-11, how the uh, ecology, pathology, and morphology of uh, global terrorism has really changed. You know, the way it has changed, if you look at its uh, ecology, how we're we really dealing with networks of terror and networks of illicit activity. So if you look at it globally, we are talking about $1.7 trillion of uh, illicit activity that starts from drug trade to human trafficking to trafficking of, uh, uh, of uh, 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 antiquities to uh, terrorism, and all of these organizations have been working uh, far, uh, far more efficiently than we really would like to see, you know, that governments work. Secondly, when you look at the pathology of these organizations, you know, if you start from Al-Qaeda all the way to Daesh, how that whole pathology has changed, that when you look at groups whose, no, uh, whose only interest is destruction, whose only interest is uh, denial of people's uh, rights. Then, uh, and uh, if you look at around Afghanistan, we're, Afga and Afghanistan we, uh, the government is fighting over 20 global terrorist organizations. And people from, uh, you know, from Russia to China to Uzbekistan to, many, uh, to Tajikistan and many other uh, 
Middle Eastern countries or fighting in Afghanistan, people who have no fight against Afghan people or the area, but somehow they, are, uh, they feel that they are part of this whole pathology of this death and destruction. And the final aspect of morphology is how these organizations are morphing and becoming more lethal in a far faster uh, level. If you look at, uh, you know, for instance, uh, Al-Qaeda took them over a decade to develop the level of lethality that it got, they got to. And but, uh, by contrast, when you look at Daesh, it took them a year or two. So when you look at all of these co uh, co combinations today, the Afghan soldiers are fighting that fight not only for the defending their own country, but also uh, supporting uh, the entire uh, uh, democratic world. Since uh, December of tw uh, 2015, the Afghan soldiers took over that task. All of the fighting that is happening in Afghanistan is done by the Afghan soldiers. The foreign forces are there to support on the, uh, on the training and logistical support. And despite all of the casualties that we're having, we have not had any problem in recruitment because the Afghan people that know and believe that this is their fight and they should make that sacrifice. Uh, so within that one, we can see, you know, that kind of give you in terms of what has been happening on the, on the picture as a whole. But if you look at the number of foreign forces that we have currently in Afghanistan, it's less than 10% of what it was in 2014. Yet with all of that, when the, in terms of any movements between that, uh, uh, this insurgencies and the government forces, uh, the amount of territory held has not really made any major difference. And there lies the issue on how we can really try to break that, uh, <laughs> try to break that uh, stalemate uh, and how we can uh, work towards uh, success. And if I quote one comment from, uh, uh, from Senator McCain's uh, speech on, uh, to SAC uh, on uh, February 9th, when he said that our concentration in the past several years has been more on the number of troops rather than success. And this is where I think uh, looking at that success is going to be so much important and the plan on how we can move forward and, uh, and try, to, uh, try to address this not only as an issue of Afghanistan, but an issue of the uh, fight against global terrorism. We look at the current uh, administration of Afghanistan two years ago when it took over. Uh, President Ghani gave his first um, you know, major speech in London on self-reliance. And basically his uh, speech was how we can really uh, create markets for Afghan products, recognizing that when you look at about 4 billion people in the world, uh, especially when you look at uh, very underserved areas, the key idea, uh, the key uh, impediment they have is the generation of markets. They do not have access to markets and also access to capital to in for investment. So uh, concentration has been what, how we, we can really do that one and what are the ways that we can proceed in that area. Uh, because there has not, I don't think there is a single country in the world that can really only rely on uh, foreign aid. There's not any country that has moved from, uh, from poverty to prosperity through foreign aid. It's usually uh, investment that can really change a country in a very fundamental way. So within that one, we got back to the very basics that if you are trying to move the economy, how we can really uh, how we can really do that. First of all, what are the resources and, and uh, assets that Afghanistan has and how we can uh, use those assets in, some, in the most uh, effective fashion. So part of it was to ask these basic four questions. What are the kind of things that the country should grow? I, improving agriculture. What do we need to extract in, in the mineral sector? And what do we need to trade in terms of trade and transit? And then finally, what do we need to manufacture? And from that basic uh, questions, we built uh, the economic structure and plans of the country. First, in terms of what to grow. Afghanistan, a country that has uh, traditionally, agriculture was always a big element of the country. But the amount of land uh, that has been er uh, irrigatable land compared to even 1980s, it's about 20% less, while the population has grown more than twice as much. So uh, the first element was how we can really develop agriculture. So developing agriculture had several elements. One, uh, given the fact that it's, uh, we are in a very arid environment, 
we need to raise, we need to be able to have more uh, dams and uh, irrigation systems. And uh, uh, one aspect of that has, is uh, our uh, the global warming aspect. Compared to three decades ago, the amount of uh, rain, the amount of uh, uh, it, the snow, uh, snow actually melts about three weeks quicker than it did three decades ago. So um, in the past, the frozen tundra was the storage. Now we get it in liquid form, and if we do not store it, it goes away. So building dams became a major importance. So in the last year and a half, we have began the design, development, and construction of about 29 different hydro, uh, 29 dams, some of them on hydroelectric capability, but most of them for irrigation purposes. The total capacity of these dams is equivalent to about two and a half Hoover dams. So it's sizable. And that would really, in a major way, impact our agriculture. Secondly, we've looked at other elements in terms of, uh, for instance, uh, in most countries, uh, uh, if you do not have the agricultural land very, uh, very uh, uh, leveled, you know, you lose a lot of water and also your yield is lower. So with that, we were able to reduce not only, only water consumption by about 25%, but increase yield by about 30%. And then also looking at markets, how we can really look at uh, connecting these market, uh, elements to the market and looking at the kind of cash crops, such as a few of them that we have been very successful from saffron to pistachios to pine nuts uh, to a series of uh, vegetables uh, and the fruits and whatever, in contrast to just growing wheat. For instance, we've realized that we can never compete with a country like well, Kazakhstan, not that far from us. So it makes sense for us to be able to use growing wheat or buying wheat from those places and develop cash crops that those environments cannot really provide. So that's how we have really looked at <coughs> on the agricultural side. On the mineral sense, uh, we have not been as successful as we would like to be. Unfortunately, uh, uh, some of the, you know, uh, the euphoria that started about seven or eight years ago has not really uh, you know, come to fruition. Part of it was not having the, uh, the skill sets on the legal sense, as well as understanding those markets very well, had really led to a lot of those false starts. So part of our efforts, and, and you know, the last element was, if you look at it since 2008, uh, the commodity markets has really been low, and that has also impacted us. For instance, even some of those uh, contracts that was given when oil was $130, and when it dropped to about 40, it was hard to keep those, uh, those same companies as interested to do exploration. Uh, similarly, when on a, uh, on a copper mine contract, when the standard uh, royalty was about seven or eight, you know, six or seven percent, and when somebody agrees on a royalty of about 19 percent, you know, this is too good to be true. And usually those things, when they are too good to be true, they, that is really the case. So these are some of the kind of the challenges that we've gotten ourselves into. So what we have, are looking right now is um, how we can really build that capacity, look at, look at these contracts in a very transparent way. And have broken that into key elements. First, how we can develop our oil and gas, which, is, which usually takes a, the shortest period of time, followed by construction materials, for instance, Afghanistan has uh, 50 different kinds of marbles, 42 different colors of marbles, some rival Italian marbles. So that's one element. So uh, from that all the way to elements such as talc and chromates and barites and others, a tremendous opportunity. Uh, even in terms of coal, Afghanistan has over a billion tons of high quality, uh, by two minutes to anthracite level, very low sulfur high calorific value coal that could really be uh, developed. Moving on from that one to precious, semi-precious materials that we have plenty, which could really be a major job creation for women and uh, less skilled uh, individuals, and especially in the rural area, to uh, metals, co copper and, uh, and iron, uh, to uh, last area, which is strategic uh, materials such as lithium. Afghanistan is one of the major sources of lithium, actually the two major areas that, uh, that are not part of uh, the, you know, the 
Chinese uh, uh, reserves is uh, the one in uh, uh, Greenland uh, uh, in Afghanistan. So these are the two areas that we see in the last is that we have 14 of the 17 uh, rare earth materials which uh, are strategically important. Uh, the next important area, of course, was uh, moving of goods and a uh, movement of and trade particularly. And when you look at trade, given the location of Afghanistan is a major asset and how we can really try to uh, take the geographic evidence that Afghanistan has because traditionally we were part of the Silk Road. But in the last two centuries, rather than being part of a major thoroughfare, we became a cul-de-sac as the marine uh, trade really started. So part of our whole effort has been how we can make Afghanistan to be back the roundabout for the region rather than a cul-de-sac. And those are on the, we've concentrated on the three key areas. First, in terms of movement, movement of goods, Afghanistan is part of, uh, gonna be in the main thoroughfare for the one belt, one road that China is building. The railroad uh, plan through that one would actually get, uh, right now, if you look at goods from China to Europe, it takes about uh, uh, seven, uh, several months. But through that railroad system, it will take seven to eight days. It will be a major change from that point. Uh, but also north-south traffic, if you look at all of the Central Asian countries, the shortest, uh, closest port to them could be the port of Charbahar in Iran or Gwadar of Pakistan. So we see that north-south as well as east-west to be major element. The second element of, of that trade is gonna be energy. If you look at Central Asian countries who are endowed with a good level of energy versus Pakistan and India that have uh, major deficiencies just on the electricity. For instance, Pakistan today has more than 15,000 megawatt deficit of electricity. I'll give you an example of one, uh, one industry, textile industry for, uh, uh, of Faisalabad in uh, Punjab, where in 2014, that's uh, about a $10 billion industry. It dropped by $4 billion because of lack of electricity. However, if they have adequate electricity, that could be over at a hundred billion dollar industry. So our hope, uh, we've already started two projects, one at Kassel 1000 to get power from K Kyrgyzstan, uh, Tajikistan, to Afghanistan to Pakistan, 1000 megawatts for Pakistan, 300 for Afghanistan. Secondly, uh, there's a project called TAP, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, that will start 2000 megawatts of power from, pa from Turkmenistan to Pakistan via Afghanistan and eventually move to 4,000. But the potential is for more than 15,000 and can easily, uh, that could easily be accommodated. And the last area is data. If you look at the, data, uh, the internet traffic globally, half of that is between Europe and Asia. And if you look at uh, those of you who are familiar with the routing of that, it goes from the Europe through Mediterranean, through the uh, Swiss Canal, Red Sea wraps around the Arabian Peninsula, Persian Gulf by the India, and then wraps to uh, China on the, uh, on the east side of China. That's why the, a data packet takes about 130 milliseconds to send from Europe to Asia. Through these terrestrial, uh, of course, those cables have maintenance issues as well as now people who can sniff those data. Trying to do those ones terrestrially would reduce the cost tremendously. And we are talking about uh, one cable that we're looking at, which will be part of a, a gas pipeline that will connect from India to Turkmenistan. Then there is a similar piece under the Caspian Sea and then uh, to Baku. And from Baku, there is one uh, pipeline already to, uh, to Italy. So we can have this line of Italy to India fiber optics that will rival and will be a, a great alternative for the Trans-Siberian uh, uh, fiber. Uh, by this fiber, we could cut that transmission time by about 35 to 40 milliseconds. Every millisecond is worth about $100 million a year. So we're talking about three to four billion dollars of potential savings in that area. Secondly, if you look at China's uh, uh, data traffic as you're looking at you know, more connection to Africa, it's gonna be potentially through major two uh, areas, one through the China, through Gwadar and Pakistan, uh, to Pakistan through the Gwadar and then to, uh, uh, to the Gulf and to, uh, to Africa. But also an alternative could be through the Wakhan Corridor in Afghanistan 
and then going down to Charbahara Gwadar to, uh, to uh, Africa. So these three elements for Afghanistan has the potential of over $3 billion of income within a decade or so. So we see that, so that, that's the potential of the, the trade area for Afghanistan. And the last one is manufacturing. One of the major dividends for Afghanistan is the, the work that was done by the, by the armed, uh, ISAF forces. All of the bases that they built for Afghanistan has tremendous asset value of over you know, 14 to $15 billion. To give you an idea about the size of those ones, the base that was built in Helmand area is bigger than Dubai Airport. The one that was built in, uh, in Kandahar house over 17,000 US soldiers and similarly in other parts of the country. But these ones have, you know, from the security, from the to, uh, system to the water and roads and telecommunication, all of that, they have all of those, all of those hardware. So have, looking at these sites to be special economic zones for building a lot for the ex export would be a tremendous advantage. And that basically is what we have been really working on. So having said so, I'll briefly tell you about what are some of the things that we have done. Last year, we built the first infrastructure plan for the country where we looked at all of these key areas. For the first time, we built the, the railroad infrastructure master plan as well as most of the feasibilities. We developed the national power grid for the country. Right now, power in electricity in Afghanistan is nine different islands connecting uh, and only serving about 30% of the population. We are going to be building the uh, national grid in the next uh, five years, but also get us uh, right now 77% of the electricity is imported. In five years, we'll get to self-sufficiency and get to a point that we can actually export uh, electricity. <coughs> on, the, on the roads, uh, we're building a lot of the main arteries between no uh, north and south, and on the, on the fiber infrastructure, as I mentioned about the potential opportunities of that one. Uh, we broke the government monopoly, so private sector can invest in it. And also on the infrastructure as a whole for the, uh, in, if you look at the last quarter of, uh, the last half of 2016, we were able to attract a good level of uh, uh, investment, both foreign and domestic. Uh, we've, invest, uh, we've attracted over $800 million of investment in the electricity area, uh, and this is building some hydropower plants, as well as uh, solar uh, projects, natural gas, and, and more. So we see the potential of that area to be uh, quite a bit more in. Right now, we have over a dozen other projects uh, in that specific area. But to do all of these infrastructure projects, you know, just a uh, couple of more uh, elements on that one. In terms of the infrastructure projects, uh, there are a number of uh, dams that we have started in the last year and a half is more than what you've done in the prior maybe 200 years or so. If you look at the amount of electricity projects that we, generation that you've started in the last uh, year, it's more than what you've done in the prior 60 years. Uh, the number of other, you know, so I think in terms of major changes that we see, the railroad was a, uh, was a dream of Afghanistan back from the days of 1880s uh, when but then less up after finishing the uh, Swiss Canal, talked about uh, railroad from uh, Berlin to Bombay, and Afghanistan became that area that the rural at that time did not want a railroad. That actually is, uh, is happening. So I think you can see that there are some major changes in, the, in those areas. But having said so, I think you know, some of the other changes that we really have, we have seen, I think uh, the economic downturn that we saw after 2014 was a very serious one. It was a, you know, basically a recession bordering on a depression. I don't think anybody had really looked at the deep impact that economically the country would see because the economy that had been built in the prior decade or so was very much a pseudo economy based on purely consumption. When this government took over, the gov uh, our imports were 21 times the exports. A country of 30 million having a, uh, an import of, I'm sorry, an export of 440 million. How can you really sustain any level of employment? So the whole idea of how we can really use the government purchasing power 
to, uh, to create a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, exports and employment has been a major e effort. And the government contracts were giving uh, local products 25% uh, preference. And as part of that one on nine, or nine to 11 key elements, the country has become self-sufficient. I'll give you one of them, not the most healthy one. If you look at 2014, Afghanistan was Im importing, imported uh, $500 million worth of soft drinks. Today, it's exporting over $500 million, I'm sorry, $200 million a year. Uh, compared to that, when you, the data of 2016, uh, the exports now it's about, the imports are about 13 times as much as the exports. You know, the major shift from 20, 2014, but there's a long way to go and the plan is within the next five years to get the balance of payments zero and hopefully you can see more, uh, more exports uh, from that point of view. Transparency and accountability is one thing because Afghanistan was so much plagued with corruption on all areas of the country. One of the key initiatives was the start of, uh, of a procurement area where the government, all of the major procurement area was uh, done through the National Procurement Council. The president sits on that one. With, uh, that's a weekly meeting that starts from 6 p.m. and sometimes goes uh, three to four hours. But we have seen major savings there. For instance, in the, just in the Ministry of Defense, the savings last year was over $250 million. We see similar savings in the Ministry of Interior. They are far behind the, than that. But across all of the ministries and the government purchases, uh, we, we have seen quite a bit of that. Uh, the way that, you know, with other changes, for instance, uh, there were, we had to change a lot of the entren uh, entrenched positions. The government changed over six, uh, 90 generals in the armed forces that had been there for us, you know, for a long period of time. Uh, major changes in the judiciary that happened where uh, uh, I think over 80 judges had been replaced and also a strong interest in bringing female judges to the system. Uh, over a year ago, the president nominated the first uh, uh, women, uh, uh, chief, uh, ju uh, women justice in the Supreme Court. Ironically, the fact that she lost was eight women parliamentarians not showing up that day because of the threats that they had received. But he has made a commitment that next year when it's the new opportunity for him to appoint another uh, justice, he is going to be uh, nominating another woman to be part of the Supreme Court. So I think uh, we're seeing improvements in many of the positions across the government and bringing more women into key positions. As part of that one, education is and human capital is an area of, of deep interest. And uh, for that one, we've, uh, we have been uh, working on developing plans on uh, not only for the universities, but really getting the curriculum aligned with the needs of the country, but more emphasis on the vocational technical. Although in the prior years, we did build a lot on the vocational technical, not much was really done to align the needs of the industry with the skills that people were given. I mean, something that, unfortunately, we have a lot of that challenge in the US as well. <coughs> we have been adopting the German model of apprenticeship, which uh, will have five schools um, started this uh, uh, next month and re-engineer re a lot of these uh, two-year uh, 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 associate degree programs to provide the skills that the country really needs. So I think if I just you know, kind of conclude on, on some of the key projects that we've done, I think what you'll see is that despite all of what you hear in the news, there are some major changes that are happening in Afghanistan, which are for the long haul, it's gonna make a major difference. Some of the key projects that has really started are for projects that, for the Afghan people, it was a dream for a long time. I'll give you the railroad, as I said, it was, people have been interested in that one since the late 1800s. And actually that's, that's happening today. There was one hydroelectric dam that the project had started over 40 years ago. And for the, fir the first, 
a dam that, were, that was uh, completed in Afghanistan last year. It was the first dam after 40 years. That was jubilation all across the country. And we have over 650 million cubic meters of water stored there, as well as producing uh, 42 megawatts of power. A third irrigation project, which is along our, in, in the south, in the Helmand areas of all places which were, uh, we got investment from a Turkish company that they're building that dam and raising that dam. It will add another 1 billion cubic meters of water as storage, which will irrigate over uh, 100,000 hectares. But the important element to remember is this is a project that was promised to these uh, people 70 years ago during the, during the monarchy. And that project is actually happening. So I think key is that these, uh, we're seeing some major changes on those areas. And then, you know, lastly, I would look at uh, the city of Kabul. Uh, back in the 1920s, the plan was to move, the, uh, uh, to move uh, all of the government offices and, uh, and ministries to, the north, uh, to one area of the city where we have the, uh, an old palace. And uh, that's actually happening because all of the ministries being in one area will free a lot of the very uh, expensive real estate in the downtown areas, which could be redeveloped and developed for different purposes. Uh, and somebody trying to develop a lot of these basic, uh, basic services, whether it's uh, from uh, cleaning streets or uh, collecting garbage or uh, s uh, storm drainage and whatever. So in these basic elements, the city has really come a long way and we're seeing major changes. So with that, I think I hope I can give you some thumbnail of uh, some of the key elements. Uh, does that mean that there are not challenges in Afghanistan? Absolutely, there's a lot of challenges. But I think then uh, the commitment and the engagement of the US and the West is in some ways is even needed for more because heaven forbid, how many of you, how many of us would, could even conceive of if all of this fails because it's gonna be something far worse than what we saw in 9-11. Uh, these, the forces of global terror are working day and night, especially for Afghanistan, having a neighbor that harbors these and provides refuge for them, makes the, uh, the issue that much even more challenging. And that's why the, uh, the deep commitment of the US is so much appreciated and so much needed, especially at this point. With that, let me stop there and thank you for your patience, Dr. Korsman. Thank you very much. I think you've outlined a very clear set of opportunities for the future. But to get to that future, <laughs> you have to get through the present. And the last year was one in which significant areas were taken over by the Taliban and other groups. There were no military challenges. Before the U.S. election, the decision was made that basically plans to withdraw U.S. advisory groups simply were not practical. This was a decision made before the election by the Obama administration, and we went from basically withdrawing advisors in 2016 to keeping them through 2021 without really defining the size of the advisory effort without any public discussion of the counterterrorism force and without any discussion of the role of US air power and other allied countries. I think that gets to an obvious question. Uh, as you look toward these economic opportunities, are you getting a clear picture of where we are going in the security dimension? Well, uh, absolutely. I, I think, first of all, we have to recall, uh, keep in mind on the, uh, the key relationship between security and economic development, because it, they are intertwined in a very major way. Yeah, when, first of all, if we go, uh, uh, go back and look at 20, uh, for, uh, late 2014, 2015, I mean, 2015 was really an existential year for the country because I think many of the for, uh, negative forces thought that uh, the country in, uh, after the, you know, the, 
the foreign forces would uh, relinquish their uh, combat role, the country will fall very much like uh, you know what happened with uh, in the Iraq and the, in the Syria area, and uh, this will be another major uh, ISIS uh, uh, like location. Unfortunately, uh, in, in specifically one of the other things that's really impacted us, uh, in some strange way, the Ukraine crisis impacted Afghanistan in a major way. That's not really much known. The reason for this is, um, if you go back uh, early on, over a decade ago, the decision was made to use rotary helicopters, basically the MI-35 Russian helicopters for evacuate medevac for in Afghanistan. Now, after the Ukraine crisis uh, with the Congress sanction, we could not use any U.S. Do, uh, US uh, funds to be able to acquire any spare parts on any or repairs or any new ones. So as part of that one, that uh, caused a major crisis for the air power for Afghanistan. And, uh, and uh, despite all of that one, I think what's, uh, what's remarkable is that our uh, our uh, forces were able to hold their ground. And if you look at the situation right now, as I you know at best, apparently they say on the 66% uh, of the districts, uh, it's under government control, about 4% under the, uh, the insurgency, and there is that 30% that goes back and forth. That was exactly the situation when we had over 100,000 uh, for, uh, combat forces from, uh, the foreign forces, uh, the ISAF forces fighting in Afghanistan. So I think that part of the security has not really changed much. Has it been what we have heard more sensationalization of it? Yes. I think if you look at uh, after October, uh, October of last year when we had the, uh, the Brussels meeting for the uh, fall of the donors in, uh, in the, uh, the EU headquarters, we have really seen an intensification of that fight and uh, which is far more than you can say that uh, it looks more of, a, of uh, an organized army fighting, the, fighting Afghanistan. The level, uh, the level of casualties, they were trying to inflict as high a casualty as they can, and actually that's why the level of casualty in, uh, in 2016 ended up to be uh, you know, much higher than the prior decade. So, I think, you know, these, you know, just to kind of state some of these challenges that we've had, but I think the other side of it is we're really looking for the first time these development projects to engage the local communities, not only immediate jobs creation, uh, but also providing them opportunities that they see their future connected to these projects. You know, I'll give you an opposite side of that one we have uh, in that uh, area of the uh, eastern part of the country, Sarubi, not far from the city of Kabul, where the first hydroelectric plant was built in the 1950s. Now, those people, even till today, are not having electricity there. So if, you are if you are living uh, with a kerosene lamp all your life and you see transmission lines going above your, your property or your village, I don't think you have much connection with that. And, or its existence or its, its working. So what we are trying to do right now is how we can really build these uh, utility corridors as economic corridors. So we can have not only roads, uh, uh, power uh, the electrification, uh, uh, canals and whatever, to help the, the local communities and these, when they see their role and their future to be tied into, that in itself improves, uh, I think, uh, security in a major way. And then lastly, I think the project that I mentioned uh, earlier about that was promised over 70 years ago, it is in the Helmand area, one of uh, the most conflicted area. And the locals have really told, um, actually uh, warned the Taliban, especially the Quata Shara in Pakistan, that you better stay away from this because this is our future and this is our livelihood. Uh, so the locals are really the ones who are really taking that uh, and, uh, and warning all of these insurgencies coming from the Pakistan that uh, uh, these uh, projects are vital to our future. And this is where we, uh, so this is going to be a longer term issue, but this is where we see the hope of the future, uh, where economic uh, opportunities would, uh, provide, would buttress uh, the security environment also.
I think as you look at this, it, it must be somewhat striking that there is virtually no mention of Afghanistan by either candidate during the presidential campaign here. You decided not to withdraw the advisors, but you set no goals for what the advisors or air power or counterterrorism force should be. And no candidate, neither candidate, ever mentioned the subject. Of all the studies that have been commissioned here to deal with security, none of them have as yet touched on the issue of Afghanistan or the levels of aid involved. And as you point out, for there to be a successful structure, security and economics have to have an integration. Sure. Is there any point at time <laughs> at which you have as yet had some idea of what kind of security assistance, what kind of plan the U.S. intends to provide for the future? Well, I'll uh, first uh, relate to the, uh, uh, the security report that was, given, that was released uh, during the Munich Security Conference about 10 days ago. And in that one, what they, you know, it's, there's, you know, and I'm paraphrasing that, where the ISIS forces, as they're seeing more, uh, being under more pressure in Iraq, uh, the Syria area, they're telling all of their supporters to concentrate more on Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Bangladesh area. So uh, assuming that with a magic wand tomorrow we see you know, the basically uprooting of uh, the uh, Daesh and ISIS in that area, I think uh, with, uh, there's going to be a heavier uh, uh, involvement of these international uh, groups um, in Afghanistan. And not only that, as I mentioned, uh, around Afghanistan we have the highest concentration of all global terrorist organizations if you look at it compared to any other parts of the world where we are for every night in Afghanistan, the Afghan forces are engaged between you know, 10 to 15 different fronts every night fighting these international terrorist organizations. And, and also it is true that a large person, um, uh, paraphrasing uh, General Nicholson, whose comment was that 70% of these Daesh members are coming from Pakistan from one particular group, one particular clan called the Uruguay tribes. So, uh, so I think this is, you know, this is not the that fight that is happening in Afghanistan has uh, is part of the fighting the international terror. That's the biggest part of the fight. It has no element of, uh, you know, looking at as as people portrayed it 10 years ago with the fighting with Taliban as a as a civil war issue. Uh, when you have all of these groups where, you know, cultivating such a large part of the poppy growth globally, and it, uh, could you say, are they really freedom fighters or drug cartels? That's something that I think the discussion needs to, and, as, and the connection of drug cartels all the way to the international terror, that's such a, you know, that's a, has become such an organic element. So I think this is where the U.S. public and uh, specifically the, uh, the major, uh, uh, I think, policy entity, especially in Washington, really need to raise that issue as part of this whole change in the, uh, uh, you know, in the ecology of uh, terrorist organization and how it's really playing a role in Afghanistan because that's the fight of all of the, you know, yeah. of the U.S. as well as all of the uh, free societies uh, because their whole element is breaking that whole uh, the bind uh, the, of, between the citizen and, uh, and uh, their governments, which, which really has become the, the basis of what uh, Daesh has been really fighting. So I think this is where groups such as CSIs and others could really play a major role in opening and having that dialogue up. So because for many, I don't think they're really uh, that knowledgeable about that uh, deep connection between what's happening in Afghanistan and the, global, the fight on global uh, terrorism. Before I turn things over to a broader question that you also touched on, the fact that at least in the near term, you face really serious economic and population 
employment problems. I think that there were some warnings that as we pulled the troops out, the aid would become a problem. But above all, an economy based on large amounts of military spending and contractors would collapse almost immediately. And it's interesting, a study done by the Asia Foundation shows an almost direct correlation between that withdrawal and how Afghans saw the national mood. Support for a positive view that Afghanistan was going in the right direction peaked in 2013 before the withdrawal at about 58 percent. At the end of 2016, popular faith that the country was moving in the right direction dropped to 29 percent. And that correlated very sharply to the economic problems as well as the security problems. Looking at this, the good news was that popular support for armed opposition groups actually dropped very sharply during the same period by more than 50 percent. And 77 percent of Afghans show no support at all. But that takes me to the problem of government and politics. And I don't wish to put too much pressure on you, but I'm going to put some anyway. I'm uh, feeling it already, so. <laughs> satisfaction with government performance <coughs> dropped from something around 78 percent to 50 percent over those two years. And the perception of corruption, which had always been a problem at a national level, rose very sharply at the local level. The political, the basic problems of governance remain critical. And I wonder if you could talk a little more about how you are trying to deal with these present issues as well as the broader development problems, which as you timed it or discussed the time frame, produce results five to ten years in the future. Sure. Well, first of all, I think if you look at going back to 2014 time frame uh, with the withdrawal, you know, if I go back even to 2010, 2011, at that time I was working uh, on some of the uh, transition plans. But the level uh, in the economic downfall that will come as part of it, but I don't think anybody expected the level of downturn uh, that we saw because in a way, the economy that had been developed under the prior administration in Afghanistan was very much a consumptive economy, an economy that was totally an aid-based economy, an economy from a you know a country that was you know at least from an agricultural point of view not only were self-sufficient but we always was an exporting agricultural uh, country where to a point that we developed the dubious distinction of uh, you know food going from the uh, from the cities to the countryside. Uh, you know, a country that, you know, getting poultry from places all as far away as, uh, as Brazil. I, mean, I don't think the poultry is, you know, it requires such a long, uh, big infrastructure or know-how or whatever. So I think it's, you know, the, the former administration of Afghanistan created such a consumptive economy that every, that the jobs that were there were all, you know, such a big part of the industry really became the jobs that was, uh, that was supporting the armed forces, uh, and uh, and uh, uh, the, in, uh, the indirect impact is what people were seeing as uh, you know, but employment and uh, but way of life. Uh, I recall first time when I, uh, this is in 2015, when I went there and I was on a helicopter ride for the city of Kabul with the habitat. And when I came back, the president asked me, "What did you see?" I said, "You know, one of the question would be is when I uh, this helicopter ride was." where people are really working. Because the whole country, the whole city of Kabul with oh, five billion population looks like a bedroom community. You don't see any area of population because all of them were working as service sector for supporting the armed forces. So that's why the drop was far more than anybody predicted. And as part of that, you know, 
we, uh, what we have been building right now is a more uh, a sus a sustainable economy. In 2000, the data from 2016 is that we're, we have built, uh, we had 2.6% economic growth and the projections for the 2017 is somewhere between four to eight. The reason that I'm saying four to eight, because that our economic activity has, our growth has always been correct, uh, connected to the amount of snow and rain we get. The snow that we got this year is about, is the highest that we've had in 21 years. And the last time we had this kind of a snow, the economic growth was about 12%. So, uh, so that's, that's uh, one of the elements in the, you know, kind of the, in the more immediate one. Now, in terms of uh, the people's perceptions and whatever, when you have, when people, uh, you know, like 70% of the population are making $2 or less, and uh, even 30% uh, or so about around the dollar. Uh, that means a large number of people are getting at most one or two meals a day. W you know, when, you, when somebody's stomach is empty, it's kind of hard to keep, keep them satisfied with the government. It's kind of hard to keep them happy with, what's, uh, with the situation. In terms of corruption, absolutely there's still a lot of corruption, but uh, I think with some of the changes that has also happened, uh, you know, uh, if you look at uh, even in the 2016, the, uh, 2015, that transpa uh, by, on Transparency International, Afghanistan was one of the lowest countries in the prior administration, part of the three, four, the bottom three to four. It moved up by about eight notches. And the potential is that and the, when the data on 2016 comes, it will even go much higher. But still, that's not enough. I mean, Afghanistan has to get itself into the, not only the higher ups and ideally to the uh, upper quartile. So changes have been made, uh, have uh, moved forward, but maybe not to the speed that uh, people, uh, you know, people's expectations uh, have been. And I think they're entitled to it, uh, to have those kind of expectations from the government. But I think if we have to uh, go back to uh, uh, the fact that the, when we have the number of the large number of returnees, what country uh, in, the, uh, in the world this year accepted more than 1.1 million people over and above its own population. It was all of the returnees from Pakistan and Iran that came back to Afghanistan. I think when you look at 2017, we'll have several, uh, several similar numbers. So when you, uh, when you look at and in what country in the world where, you know, they are fighting 10 to 15 different fronts every night, from uh, 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 fighting terrorists from over 20 countries. The, you know, you have to look at all of those elements, and yes, within that context, that's how we look at it. But as far as the general population, do they deserve better? Absolutely. Are, are some of the plans that the government is working on to make lives better? Absolutely. Had we achieved the level of success that we would have liked to as quickly as possible? No. Uh, but uh, again, part of it has been the, the multitude of all of these different issues uh, that has, uh, and, and in, in the last will be is the whole nature of the unity government makes it um, that much more difficult in getting anything moving because it requires so much more consultative effort, which uh, is not really the case in a, in a, in a, new, in a normal election process. So I think those are some of, the, some of the things, but I think what we see is that I think the prospects to the future looks hopeful, not as fast as we would like it, but at least the gains that we're making is more sustainable than a hype or any uh, short term. In a way. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to open things up for questions. We do have microphones. Please wait for the microphones. Once again, if you would identify yourself and ask one question, ending in a question mark, <laughs> I'd be very grateful. Let me begin with the gentleman in the second row there. My name is Saeed I'll wait for the microphone, survey. please. And uh, we discussed, you know, the mineral problem yeah. while, uh, while you were in New Zealand. Take a few of them. Uh, you closer. brought up two, two excellent points. It's on. It's on, yes. I can shout. Yes. Two excellent points. One was 
that the country cannot put back on its feet by donation only. Yes. So investment is important. And the second point was the locals, that the locals want to help. Now my question to you was that you have deposits in Afghanistan that you can start today in less than two years you have the product, the small mining. And if you have these projects, the people will help for the security because it is a job maker and uh, 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 helping you know the, uh, the area. How <coughs> close you are to start small mining in Afghanistan? Well, first of all, thanks for the question and uh, the great service and help that the U.S. Geological Service had provided for Afghanistan. I think uh, you know, data that came uh, out uh, several years ago not only gave a new sense of optimism, but also the success that Afghanistan can have in the future. I think in terms of the mining, what we have really realized is that the way the approaches that we've uh, given in terms of a legal framework that we can do these things in a very transparent way, in a way that would really have a, a plain, uh, level playing field. Those are the kind of things that we did not have. Yes, have we you know, given a lot of mining contracts in the last several years yet? Uh, in this artisanal level, over 400. But how many of them had really been transparent? How many of them was really given to a point that really gave uh, uh, you know, uh, fair market value and how much of that was done through uh, less than transparent and, uh, and uh, ways. So I think uh, our hope right now is really at this point to get to a, a better legal regime uh, for extractive, because uh, in the extractive world is the least transparent world anywhere. Uh, for a country that had very limited legal uh, you know, horsepower, it, it's even more. And specifically in our mining uh, ministry, with the leadership changes and challenges and lack of adequate staff, that, uh, ad qualified staff, you know, I'll give you an example of it. This is about six months ago. You know, less than six months ago, we had the president has these meetings with uh, different ministries, and we had all, everyone at the general director level and above with uh, with that ministry. And the next day, the president was quite was quite the, uh, you know taken back and said, you know, what I realized is that such a small level of uh, of uh, capacity, uh, professional capacity, is really there in the ministry. Either we have those who went to the polytechnic uh, Soviet-style school that started back, uh, and these ones have more than 30% have hardly been outside their country, or some who are recent graduates of the Kabul University. Very few who have knowledge specifically in the extractive industries or in legal sector uh, being trained abroad. And so part of what we've been trying to do is to at least build some of this framework, hopefully soon, but also work on some of the contracts that we currently have, uh, whether it's in the, especially in the oil and, oil and gas sector, as well as the uh, construction material, which some of them find in the uh, this, um, uh, artisanal level in a, in a much more open way. But our hope is that within the next year, we see some significant changes. Let's see. Uh, the gentleman in the second row there. Hi, my name is Mohammed Tahir from Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty. My question is, the, lately, Russia is flirting with the Taliban in Afghanistan. Reports has been everywhere. Why it is doing that? What the timing tells you? And it appears that Afghan officials are not happy with that. And what you are doing concretely to stop it? Thank you. Well, I think and it's unfortunate that uh, uh, that Russian's role in uh, in Afghanistan, as it uh, on the security side, had uh, really took a change after the Ukraine crisis. Uh, I think the you know the the news that they have been collaborating with Taliban or supporting Taliban has been quite unfortunate, and unfortunately they are doing it. I think part of it is that any country recognizing or differentiating between good uh, terrorists and bad terrorists is making a major folly and a major mistake. 
they are no good and bad terrorists, they're only terrorists. And uh, trying to, you know, and for, uh, for Russia trying to do this under the folly that, well, this is the way that they can stop Daesh. Uh, you know, when you look at the Taliban groups uh, with all, among all of these other 20 terrorist organizations, all of these groups compete, but as well as collaborate in different individual areas. So I think uh, this is a very bad thing. And it's basically when you have countries that are becoming part of sponsoring terrorism, it's not only good for the region, it's eventually is not going to be good for Russia as a whole. And uh, our hope is that Russia would really begin to see the light uh, in, uh, in, in such activities. Uh, the gentleman in the fourth row there. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mahmoud El Sharawi. I'm with American University. Um, Dr. Kayumi, you've talked about ambitious projects in Afghanistan and tremendous opportunities. Uh, do you agree that it is still fragile um, in in the light of the terrorist, the recent terrorist attacks in in Kabul and uh, um, the continuous uh, insurgency? And do you think it is inevitable to have peace talks with Taliban? Um, and uh, because the uh, the American foreign assistance under uh, Trump administration um, will be, or it's prone to be, uh, substantially cut for Afga for Afghanistan. So, what is your perspective? Well, first of all, the, uh, the government of Afghanistan has been interested in all parties who, have, who feel they have a fight uh, in Afghanistan to come to the table and have discussion without any. Uh, without any preconditions, and that's how uh, the government was able to uh, uh, to you know basically achieve peace with one of those groups that have fought the country uh, for uh, you know the Golbuddin Hikmatyar group uh, a year ago. The, you know uh, that uh, gesture uh, was made again with the Taliban. Uh, unfortunately, none of the groups came forward. So I think part of it would be, is, uh, you know, to what extent maybe those individuals in those groups feels that they can win in the uh, in a war uh, rather than you know sitting down in a negotiation. Is that part of it, or is that part or the motivation of their sponsors and those who provide refu refuge for them? Those are the kind of questions that I think really needs to be asked, because uh, as I said, whenever you provide refuge for uh, terrorist organizations who are involved in the largest drug cartel in the world, are, they really, uh, are, you, are you really providing, and are you really helping your own country when you do that one? So I think the part of it with the Taliban is that the, the President Ghani has made the gestures many times and has said that it's open without any preconditions to have discussions, and, but, uh, they have to accept some basic facts, which is in the government of Afghanistan, the constitution of Afghanistan, and the role of women, which is the third element of the constitution of Afghanistan. Those ones are not negotiable. Beyond that one, there are no preconditions. We're interested in talking. But unfortunately, their sponsors, I don't think their sponsors have really allowed them to talk. Uh, the gentleman in the second row there. My name is Michael Albin. I'm an independent researcher. Thank you for both, and my question is for both of you. Do you see, after a month of the new administration, do you see answers to the questions we're asking about, about directions both militarily and, uh, and in the development sphere? Are we seeing a policy? Are we seeing a strategy being developed here in Washington? I just want to take that first. <laughs> I think it is important to note that General Nicholson has, he's the commander in Afghanistan, come back to both testify to the Congress and meet with the Secretary of Defense and with the Joint Chiefs. There certainly has been the discussion of providing a stronger advisory effort. Again, the details of any changes in the counterterrorism force or in the air component have not been made public. There is also a 60-day effort to redefine in broad terms U.S. strategy. Exactly what the content of that will be has not been defined. 
On the aid side, the U.S. has already made commitments. It is very unclear that there will be differences. And there obviously is a discussion of the overall level of foreign aid, but whether that's tied to Afghanistan is something that has not been made public. And I think in fairness, uh, we sometimes expect a little too much. After more than half a century of working with transitions, you almost never really get a change in strategy, force plans, and defense that lasts in less than three to six months. But some of the immediate issues which we'll deal with this campaign season have been addressed. We don't see as yet clear decisions on the outcome. That's something that may take a while. But the administration does seem to be committed to providing a stronger train and assist mission and potentially other elements. Well, from what uh, Dr. Crossman said, and I uh, couldn't have said it uh, as eloquently as you stated it, I think we have been very much heartened by the, uh, by, uh, the current administration's uh, focus on the whole issue of the global terrorism. I think that's, that's quite important. Uh, and also, I think uh, they're really seeing uh, the potential economic uh, opportunities in Afghanistan as to how it can really help uh, the Afghan people, specifically as it looks to the, uh, to the, uh, for the ex extractive industries. I think the commitments that, uh, uh, that we've seen on general terms have been uh, very positive, and it, that makes us hopeful. Let's see. The gentleman in the second row here. Please wait for the mic. Uh. Thank you very much. My name is Raghubir Goyal. I'm a journalist in Washington with India Globe in Asia today. My question is very simple and straightforward. From Obama administration to Trump administration, where you go? And finally, the triangle of India, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. What role Pakistan is playing and what role you think India is playing? Because India had invested more than $3 billion in the development of Afghanistan. Thanks, sir. Well, first of all, our relationship with India is, has been a very historic relationship. It has been, uh, you know, more than a millia, millennia in terms of its length. Uh, uh, the relationship with Afghanistan and, uh, and uh, India has been strictly an economic and uh, cultural relationship. And, and Afghanistan has no uh, secret agreements with India on any topic. All of our relationship uh, has been very much uh, transparent and very much on economic and regional cooperation. And uh, the Afghan people are very thankful to the, uh, to the support that they have received uh, from, the, you know, from the government and, uh, and people of India. The projects that they have support, uh, supported in Afghanistan has been uh, developmental projects, uh, as I mentioned that. Uh, hydroelectric dam, that was the first dam that closed after 40 years. That was supported by, uh, by the Indian government. Uh, right now, the package of aid that they have, that they have promised Afghanistan is about a billion dollars uh, for, uh, uh, you know, for a series of uh, projects where it's going to be resettlement and it's going to be hospitals, uh, work, human capital, as well as a number of other infrastructure projects. So. Uh, the relationship that we have with India is a very strong relationship, and it's based on building a better um, and more secure area of, uh, for the region where we can have uh, better economic conditions uh, for all. I mean, uh, right now, as the borders uh, last year, when you know one of the things that one of the challenges that we have had with Pakistan, whenever it's that period of the year when we our fruits uh, uh, ripen that somehow mysteriously they closed the borders. Uh, what was done, uh, what the agreement that was made last year with uh, India and thanks to India where they, raised, uh, they re uh, waived a lot of the tariffs where we are airlifting a lot of that fruits from Afghanistan to India. Uh, now, as it relates to Pakistan, unfortunately, Pakistan has been trying to drag, at least in, uh, uh, in rhetorics, uh, the issues and challenges that they have with, uh, with India as Afghanistan being part of that issue. Afghanistan has no link linkages 
no opinions or whatever on those issues. That's the, a that's the bilateral issue between India uh, and Pakistan. Uh, I'll give you one example of an issue that could really help the region as a whole and the three countries. There's a, there's a stretch of land uh, between, the, uh, between Pakistan and India and, the, uh, and their uh, Waga Atari border, about six kilometers, you know, less than four miles, where when we get the trades from Afghanistan to, to, uh, to India, it has to go through, uh, it has to stop and reload, uh, unload everything at the Waga put on uh, the sets of trucks and then pack it up in Atari, which is really adding so much cost. If we can get some agreements as part of that whole relationship, it will, be, it will in, enhance uh, uh, trade for the three countries that will have a major impact on poverty reduction in Pakistan. And in Pakistan, a country of over 200 million people, having an economy smaller than Israel, really gives you an, uh, an idea of how many lost opportunities that country has and how people have been get, kept down in terms of potential economic prosperity that they can have. As I mentioned earlier, I mean, the whole example of, uh, of uh, the, the textile industry uh, where, um, uh, you know, it's a 10 billion, but could, uh, and they lost 4 billion, which actually could be at $100 billion. You know, right now, for instance, uh, in, uh, the cotton that they, that they get for the textile industry from Uz uh, Uzbekistan goes to Turkmenistan, to Iran, to the Bandar Abbas uh, port by the uh, uh, Persian Gulf, puts on the, bar, uh, on the uh, boats, goes all the way to uh, Karachi, then it gets on the train and gets to Faisalabad in, in Punjab. While that same thing from, Turk, from, Uzbek, from Uzbekistan on the truck could take a day and a half to get to those places. And, and actually, we, this is one of the project, uh, elements that we offer to the Uzbekistan that we would rather do that one. It will be helpful for all of those countries. You know, that, you know, I'll just give another example of that. Them, uh, when we, they were trying to get the uh, gates from India to Afghanistan, since Pakistan, Pakistan did not allow, did not want to allow any product from India, you know, from India to go to Afghanistan to go through Pakistan, it had to be actually gone in air flow to through Iran and uh, I think some parts even through Azerbaijan and got to Afghanistan and it took about six months. That was a hydroelectric dam, which I don't think uh, hydroelectric dams have a lot of military purposes. It was irrigating land and it was producing electricity for the rural area. So our hope is that Pakistan sees that as stable and prosperous Afghanistan is to this, uh, and adds to the stability and prosperity of Pakistan, rather than uh, seeing this um, win-lose situation, which uh, is uh, not helping Pakistan and not helping the whole area. If I may follow up, you mentioned earlier the, you used the word returnee yeah. from Pakistan and Iran. As far as I know, they are actually expelled. Yes. And sometimes with very little notice and without any support. Yeah. And this was over a million last year, wasn't yes. it? Yes. Do you face a similar level of expulsions this year? Uh, yes. I think after the spring, the, the numbers will start. And uh, I mean, in, as far as the Afghan government co is concerned, they're all Afghans. They are, uh, that's part of, they are nationals. They're welcome in the country. And uh, within the resources that we have, we're trying to see what we can do to accommodate them. That's their country. And uh, actually, the, one of the things that Pakistanis and some of them, they are trying to, what they even uh, advertise and tell in many of their mosques, uh, calling the Afghans as Hindu, love, uh, Hindu brothers. That basically has become the word that they're trying to use just to develop local kind of uh, expulsion and hatred towards the Afghan communities that had lived in those areas for, the, for some of them, maybe for two decades or more than one generation. Uh, the gentleman in the sort of back row there. Excuse me. Mr. 
So my name is AJ Glubzinski. I'm associated with the University of Maryland School of Public Policy. Uh, my question was about domestic political legitimacy, uh, specifically uh, related to uh, delayed uh, parliamentary elections, um, and also with the infrastructure projects coming forward, um, what concerns there might be as far as the, uh, the ability to maintain legitimacy if those projects are not uh, you know, well dispersed, and to what extent is the parliament contributing um, to, the, to the master infrastructure planning? Uh, uh, just to make sure I understand what do you mean in terms of the legitimacy of those infrastructure projects? Uh, could you elaborate a little bit on it? I, I want to make sure that I understand your question correctly. Yeah, my question was just, was just uh, to what extent the, the parliament was providing uh, input and consent towards the infrastructure plan that was being developed. Well, parliament, uh, all of the annual budget of the projects that we have, it goes through the parliament. And even the aid that we get, uh, which has been off budget, one of the, from uh, various sources, one of the elements that the government has been insisting and, uh, and interested is to move more and more of them on budget. So actually that way the, uh, the parliament has more say-so and oversight on, on, uh, on those uh, projects. In terms of the election, the government has made the commitment that we'll have the parliamentary elections this year, and it's going to happen. The gentleman there in the uh, second row, third row, I guess. Hi, my name is Luke Wilson. I'm with the Center for Water Security and Cooperation. You spoke about some of the legal challenges facing the mining and extractives industries. Can you talk about some of the legal challenges surrounding water in general in Afghanistan, uh, even after the 2009 water law? Thank yes. you. Uh, you know, Afghanistan being uh, the upper Riparian for five of its six, uh, you know, for six neighbors, uh, you know, uh, while we only have um, agreement with one of our neighbors, uh, uh, primarily uh, Iran. Uh, I mean, when that agreement took a, a long period of time in the making and before it was made and it was actually signed over four years ago. And uh, up to now, we have not had the means to actually implement that one and enforce it, which hopefully with uh, one dam that we're looking at to hopefully start soon, it could happen in a few years. You know, uh, uh, those of you who are familiar with water laws and specifically trans uh, transboundary water, that's one of the most difficult and, uh, and politically charged areas. That particular agreement had about a hundred, uh, roughly a hundred years of studies and uh, negotiations before that it was actually signed. Now, I hope that other ones would not take a hundred years. <laughs> uh, uh, but we recognize that that's one of the challenges that we have to work on and, uh, and, uh, uh, and look at that uh, and try to develop a way that uh, the country, uh, that the water that leaves Afghanistan would help you know, based on uh, you know, based on the uh, international laws or international riparian laws, Afghanistan is very committed in keeping those. Uh, but at the same time, part of it would be as a, as a whole region recognizing that the population is growing, and um, uh, and uh, global warming has not really uh, has not been a friend to that area. Uh, uh, Afghanistan is a country that has the the lowest of any country, basically almost of any country has the lowest uh, um, carbon footprint, but it's one of the most sus uh, susceptible countries in terms, of the, uh, 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 in terms of the global warming impacts. So we, those impacts are really coming, but part of it would be it's not only for Afghanistan, but all of the countries in the area to begin using water in a more judicious way. Uh, I think for many, Water is looked at as a resource that has no value, and it's kind of like oxygen. Uh, that's not the way that water can be looked at. We recognize that water is one of our most important resource, and also something that we have a leverage on. But part of that is hopefully we can use that leverage in a way that we could improve and increase uh, uh, bilateral and regional cooperation. Uh, which could be a win-win for not only Afghanistan, but the region as a whole. I mean, just one example, a simple example that I mentioned, just by leveling agricultural land, you can reduce water consumption by 25% and increase yield by 30%. Wouldn't, be, wouldn't that be something good to do? 
rather than really use more and more of it. So. Uh, the lady in the second row. Hi, Meg Kolingowski with Navistar Defense, and we are an MRAP and truck manufacturer and actually assembled trucks in Afghanistan back <laughs> in the late 60s and early 70s. Um, so I, I, was, I was interested in your comment on your um, uh, increasing vocational and technical education, yeah. and I just wondered if you could elaborate a little bit more on where you are with that and how that's okay. being implemented throughout the, the nation. Okay. Uh, the vocational technical, as I said, uh, we had, you know, over the course of the prior 15 years, 13 years or so, they had started about you know, uh, 300 some odd programs. But the way it was structured was, uh, was doomed to failure in my view. A part of it was the way they was structured was, uh, you know, the number, uh, we have developed uh, maybe in all third world countries, but specifically Afghanistan, an expectation that everybody will go to high school, they go to universities, they graduate and then become unemployed. I mean, this is basically had been, you know, when we have over 67% of our, of our college graduates being unemployed, what does that mean? Either it means that they do not have, they do not get the, uh, any skills or the skills that they get is uh, irrelevant. So in order to provide some relief politically, you know, for those who are applying for the, for the entrance exams at universities, they created uh, you know, some relief valve, and the relief was, well, those who could do not pass the entrance exam to go to universities will take these individuals and, uh, and they can enroll in these uh, um, vocational technical programs. Well, these individuals had no interest in going to vocational technical. So that becomes a two-year program that they're going. Actually, the surveys that we had done, 97.5% of them was not interested in pursuing in the areas that they were being trained at. Many of them were, you know, from more well-to-do families who were trying to run the family businesses and whatever. So the idea was, why not spend all of that money and uh, educate them in an area that either they will try to go through some fly-by-night uh, uh, private school and kind of get a piece of paper that says bachelor's, which means nothing. Or uh, we need to uh, look at it, you know, quite differently. One of the people who have done an excellent work in that area was... Uh, a German uh, doctor uh, who really evaluated our in the vocational technical program, especially the old traditional guild model, um, uh, which was you know people master environment and uh, uh, traditional skills, and he really realized that the the model that we have there is the one that actually uh, provides the largest number of our vocational technical people roughly training over a million people on a continual basis with zero government support. And his view was, well, which, uh, that model is so much similar to what Germany had 150 years ago. And if we can modernize that system, that's what would really help us in providing the vocational technical uh, with some changes, how we can really give those. In the, first of all, the, that model takes a person five to seven years to get from a people to, you know, ma uh, to, from an apprentice to a master, uh, to master uh, uh, journey level, how that could be shortened. Uh, second, how we can really uh, give those individuals some literary uh, and numeracy skills, so, and then how we can infuse new technologies. We're starting five of those schools as a, as a, as a pilot uh, in about a month or so. Uh, three in, uh, in, the, in the capital, two uh, in the city of Mazar in the north. Also, how we can really bring women into the vocational technical area, because a lot of these uh, traditional ones have been male dominated. And secondly, for that 13th and 14th year, <coughs> we've been, first we've been working with a, with a, a Dutch on a agricultural vocational technical but also try to develop them along the uh, key areas that the country needs in our key areas are agriculture, um, mining, uh, logistics, healthcare, uh, basic business, and, uh, and a few more. And try to, and I try to work with industry because, I mean, even in the US that has been, you know, the vocational technical has been a major failure because you know, it's uh, almost accepted globally that the, Anglo-Saxon model of vocational technical has been a failure. 
And the model that we really see as success in, in the globally is the German model, which is uh, used by you know, half a dozen uh, countries in Europe, from Swiss to Holland. And um, uh, uh, you know, to give you one example of that one, you know, everybody, every country touts um, uh, uh, Finland as having the best high, uh, K through 12 system because on PISA scores they have always scored the highest. But Finland has 21% youth unemployment rate. By contrast, Switzerland has 4.8, and that's the same for natives as well as immigrants. So there is almost a correlation between youth unemployment and the level of apprenticeship program that there are. So what we are trying to do is to, you know, to adapt more as a German vocational technical model in getting the industry involved and give the training and competencies in the areas that those entities need. Uh, we're working with the World Bank to, and the plan is for 2017 to train a lot of the teachers. And then the next year is to try to start some of these prog uh, re uh, programs in, a, in this uh, new model. So that's where we are for the 13 and 14, but the, uh, those who will be getting for the ninth grade on this new model it will start in about a month or so. Dr. Kiyomi, I know you have two more meetings today. Uh, I don't actually about four more. But four more, all right. So do you have time for another question or two? Or? Sure, by all means, let's, uh, let's I will be, I'll try to be, the questions oh. are short, I'll make it, I'll give short answers also. All right, the gentleman in the uh, second row there. Hi, my name is Austin Mix, and I'm from Furman University, but I'm studying up here this semester. Um, my question to you is, how effective is the government being at transitioning Afghan farmers away from opium to other sorts of crops? I think that program has not been successful at all. Because what, uh, you know, uh, with all of the partners that we have worked on, they've only, you know, it's not only okay that uh, you can, uh, opium is $10 and we'll have, why don't you grow this product for $5? But it's, uh, you know, building the whole infrastructure and in the, in the, uh, the supply chain system on how they could really get uh, loans how their products could get to the market, what are the value added steps and things that needs to be happening. That's the part that uh, unfortunately has been missing. Just, uh, the second part is that if you look at countries you know, that, that produce opium, it's all our uh, drugs as a whole, the, you're talking about countries with, with a GDP of below 700. So one of the easy problem is that, uh, issue, issue is that if we can raise everyone's economic standards, they'll not be growing opium. Uh, so the, the, pro, pro, uh, the programs that we have had has not been successful, uh, and uh, you know my comments about that uh, about a month ago in, uh, in a program was uh, if you do exactly what we have done in the past and expect a different re uh, results, we know what we call that. And that's exactly what we have on that front. Uh, the third row, the young lady there. Hi, Meredith Howe from University of New Hampshire. I was wondering what is being done um, to help um, encourage women and girls to become educated, especially in rural parts of the country? Yeah. Well, I think a number, I'll mention a number of steps that uh, would improve. First of all, uh, if you do not have a lot of women teachers, it's kind of hard to get this, uh, kids interested, especially after elementary school. That's where we see a lot of the drop off. So part of what we're trying to do is to see how we can build uh, more of these uh, women uh, 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 teachers training programs at the region level, not only in the center. But when you talk about those programs, then you know, place uh, we've seen a big uh, uh, difference between places where they are, they have dormitories for girls versus where they don't have dormitories. Uh, and you know, when you've seen in the schools. Uh, you know, getting back to the very basics, how many of them actually have uh, restrooms that these girls can go to versus, uh, you know. So th there has been a number of these elements that we're really looking at to really be able to uh, change the situation and provide more opportunities. But the other part is when you look at education with today's technologies and even, you know, even in Afghanistan, 89% proliferation of cell phones 
to what extent we can provide the education and using technologies in ways that will be more, more effective. Unfortunately, a lot of the international consultants have zero clue about them because they still would like to use the models the way they were trained in the 19th century. But, uh, but this is where I think uh, use of technology and, uh, and uh, also for them seeing opportunities. Uh, you know, the opportunities that we really see is how we can really train more entrepreneurs, train them more into the, uh, not only uh, how many girls could get uh, government jobs. Uh, I think some of, you know, one program that we've started in 17 provinces last year and we're trying to do that in the other 17 this coming year is uh, called Table Gardens where developing uh, small agricultural uh, projects at the home level where women not only can meet their own needs but also and help the nutritional uh, fortification for the family but also they can sell some of their products uh, to the to the local markets as one as well as a series of those kind of programs which uh, you know one of the other programs that we are hoping to do it's you know it's still in the early stages uh, it was done in Africa it's called cyber girl uh, not cyber girls the uh, uh, solar, solar, I think solar girls or something along that line where people can actually have these um, uh, solar uh, uh, lanterns or whatever that they charge and then they can distribute it within the village and it's, uh, and it's uh, that's just one type of programs but those are the kind of programs that we're more interested to see how we can really bring a sense of entrepreneurship and, uh, and self-starting uh, uh, businesses rather than how they can just become part of uh, you know, a bureaucracy or something. Ladies and gentlemen, I realize that Dr. Kayumi only has four more meetings today, so we could normally go on for several more hours. But I think, uh, in all fairness, he's already done a superb job. And may I ask you to thank him in the usual manner. <laughs> <laughs>